Hello and welcome everyone to the special guest lecture in the religious religion of India class at the University of West. My name is Miro Sake, chair of the Department of Religious Study and instructor of the religion of India class. Today it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Stanisar Timulsina. Uh, he holds the position of chair in classical uh, in Indic humanities in the Department of Asia, Asian and Asian American Studies at Stony Brook University, New York. Uh, Dr. Timursila earned his master's degree from Sampurananda Sanskrit University in Banaras, India. He established the Department of Tantric Studies at Nepal Sanskrit University in 1991 and taught there before pursuing his PhD at Martin Luther University in Halle, Germany, which he completed in 2005. During his doctoral studies, Dr. Timosna also taught at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Washington uh, University in St. Louis. Uh, since 2005, he has been teaching at San Diego State University in the Department for the Study of Religion, specializing in Hindu studies and comparative philosophies and religion. Aside his uh, formal education, Dr. Timosna received classical training in Vedic and Tantic tradition from various renowned scholars. He published his dissertation in 2006 titled Seeing and Apprehends a History of the Advaita uh, Doctrine of Distasticity uh, and expanded his research into consciousness studies with his book Consciousness in Indian Philosophy, published by Rulet in 2009. He later focused on tantric study, publishing two books, Language of Image, Meaning, and Visualization in Tantras uh, and Tantric Visual culture or cognitive approach. And Dr. T uh, Timulsina has authored over 80 articles sp spanning Hindu philosophy, tantric studies, yoga studies, and comparative philosophy. In 2019, Dr. Timulsina established the Bimarsa Foundation to promote philosophical knowledge from diverse Hindu school of thoughts. So the topic of the lecture is, uh, today's lecture is introduction to Kashmir Shaivism. And without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stanisar Timalsana. Namaskara. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor for me to be here among you. Uh, before 2019, uh, I felt awkward to just speak alone, you know, like in these <laughs> online mediums. Uh, and I thought that this is just uh, like uh, talking to oneself. In the past four or five years, I have made some progress in realizing that we can connect with the globe through these modern media and spread the knowledge uh, for the awareness of the world. There is still very little knowledge as it comes to the non-Western uh, philosophies and spiritual practices. And some of these could be very helpful for us to um, move beyond our own closet and to recognize universality. And today, Professor Sakir asked if I could share uh, my knowledge on Kashmiri Shaivism, and it comes with the different titles, Trika Shaivism, Pratyavigya, many other names that we will discuss um, eventually. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I will give enough time for the Q&A. Uh, I'll try my best, but you can start raising your hand, electronic hand, I mean. And, and I will know that there are questions there, and that way we can swiftly move from a monologue to a dialogue, which is the best means to learn anything. When we talk about uh, Kashmiri Shaivism, we have to start in general about Shaivism, and even that we need to start from Hinduism and India and uh, uh, so we, I don't want to get lost in this broad introduction 
because if I go through history, I will not be able to come to talk on the Kashmiri Shaivism as such. So to start exactly from the point of the Shaivism, um, originally Shiva appears as an outcast deity or a uh, subordinate deity in the early Vedic literature. And around the common era, it seems that the old uh, ritualistic um, uh, Vedic philosophy waned and new movements uh, came into being. Uh, there are many factors. There were multiple Sramana movements. Uh, Buddhism and Jainism were coming to prominence. And you can see that in the Mahabharata itself that uh, a new type of religiosity was emerging in classical India. And even when we talk of early Shaivism, there is not one particular type of practice to say this was what they did. Most likely the worshiping of the Lord in the phallic form, Shiva Linga, might have been a universal motif, but it goes beyond history. You can find in different cultures, honoring, respecting these um, uh, uh, gender representative symbols of the divine. And so I cannot say that uh, specifically even the worship of Linga and Yoni um, or worshiping the mother in the vaginal form and the creative source in the phallic form is exclusive to Shaivas only. It may have been a broad practice at one time but now that is exclusively to the Shaivas for sure. And then there are the Southern movements, um, this, like the Shaivism in South India. Some have even argued that uh, maybe uh, Shiva is the Harappan deity, proto-Aryan deity. And when the Aryans came, assimilated into the Vedic practices, this is a debatable topic. And again, I am going to reserve myself entering into that jungle. So from what we know now, uh, there are these texts and the practices and temple and art expressions of Shiva uh, in the Agamas. And the, these agamas are threefold. The some of the original agamas are following a dualistic philosophy. They are explicitly called the Shaiva agamas, and there are some dualistic and non-dualistic philosophy. They are called the Raudra agamas, and there are some explicitly non-dual. Uh, agamas, they are called the Bhairava Agamas. And when we are talking about Kashmiri Shaivism, we are particularly stressing on the Bhairava Agamas, the non-dual modes of practices. Today, when people talk of Kashmiri Shaivism, immediately we think of a few figures like Abhinava Gupta or Kshemaraja. And the philosophy, a non-dual Shaiva philosophy has been synonymous to Kashmiri Shaivism. I would say this is yet again a stereotype and a misnomer because the Siddhanta Shaivism, which is a dualistic in nature or dualistic, non -dual, qualified non-dualistic in nature, the, Prominent acharyas of this, uh, such as Ramakantha, were from Kashmir. 
and majority of this like Sadhya Jyoti, uh, Shitikanta, many of the prominent Siddhanta Shaiva authors came from Kashmir. It is only that in the later part of the 20th century, in the Western academia, a sort of consciousness came to read particular texts and particular philosophies, and we have approved that brand, and we have to rehearse how much of these stereotypes are actually helping or not helping. Another factor, when we talk of Kashmiri Shaivism, many people think that this philosophy, Shaiva philosophy, is localized, is explicitly practiced by people from Kashmir. Historically, this is not the case. Many of the temples in Kerala are now found practicing the type of Kavika Kulakrama that was prominent in Kashmir. But not just that. If you ever go to Nepal, you will find that the practice of Guhyakali, Kubjika, and Siddhi Lakshmi are at the heart of the tantric practices in Nepal, and these constitute the esoteric part of what we are calling Tantric Shaivism or Kashmiri Shaivism. And at least from around 10th or 11th century, Nepal can boast of having an uninterrupted lineage of practices, and in particular, in the practice of Kuyakali and Kubjika, the central agamas like Jayadratha Yamala, Brahma Yamala, Kubjika Mata come to play, come to practice in everyday ritual manuals. And these texts are pivotal in the composition of the philosophy that we now know as Kashmiri Shaivism. So therefore, I had to give you a little bit of a historical background that uh, uh, the Shaivism may not have been reserved only to Kashmir, and the contributors may not have always been the philosophers from Kashmir alone. That does not mean that uh, the major contribution and establishment didn't happen in Kashmir. It is the case that most prominent figures, most prominent philosophers came from Kashmir. Now we will go to Kashmir itself. From around 9th through 11th century, just about 200 years, and this beautiful philosophy of Shaivism evolved in Kashmir. The philosophers you can name are uh, Vasugupta, Somananda, Utpala Deva, Abhinava Gupta, Kshema Raja, uh, Raja Naka Jayaratha, just to name a few. Many of these philosophers were also a prominent aesthetes. They were also writing theories of aesthetics as well as composing poetries sapped with those aesthetic theories. Abhinava Gupta himself was a polymath. He did not just write on Tantra. He wrote Tantra Loka for a particularly Tantric philosophy, but he is known for his commentaries upon uh, Utpala Deva's magnum opus, the Ishwara Pratyavijya. And he also composed a voluminous commentary on the Natya Shastra. This is on theatrics. So he, and besides many other works, setting aside all the other works on literature, aesthetics, and medicine and other aspects, if we focus just on the Shaiva philosophy, because that is the topic for the day, 
what we learn is we really cannot learn Kashmiri Shaivism if we are very dogmatic about it. That's what we have to learn. What do I mean by that? Kashmiri Shaivism or the compositions of Utpala Deva, Somananda and Abhinava Gupta did not happen in a vacuum. They were reading the philosophies of their counterparts, other contemporaneous philosophers, and they were responding, critiquing the philosophies of their counterparts. The prominent philosophies of that era were those following the lines of uh, um, uh, Dharma Kirti, and a Pragyakara Gupta was a Kashmiri, prominent Kashmiri philosopher. There were some uh, Sautrantika Yogachara philosophers from the Buddhist front. And um, if you read uh, not just Abhinava Gupta, even when you read uh, uh, Ramakanta, what you will find is a meticulous scrutinizing of Buddhist philosophy. To tell you the truth, sometimes I said they were more sincere and honest in reading their Buddhist counterparts than contemporary Buddhist philosophers. Why am I saying this? They were not following those philosophies. How can you say they were not following but still faithfully reading? The point is, we are now turning into some weird faith group people. And the Western modes of addressing religion, if you have read the Soren Kierkegaard, he says, with where reason ends, faith begins. So basically, a general understanding of the Western modes of religiosity is that I follow whatever I follow, it is not your problem. You should not question anything. These are the articles of my faith. So if I am worshiping flying spaghetti monster and you are meditating on the Buddha nature, simply our modern understanding from the Western religious perspective is that I have the right to worship the spaghetti monster and you have the right to contemplate on the Buddha nature. You should not question my faith. I will not question your faith. This is not how Hindus and Buddhists develop their religiosity in the classical times. We were disagreeing brothers, meaning we loved each other to the extent that uh, we would not agree on most of the articles, but we would never stop talking and never stop arguing with each other. Therefore, if you remove the works of, for example, uh, Kumari Labhatta and only want to read Dharma Kirti, good luck with you. The same way, if you remove Dharma Kirti and only want to read Abhinava Gupta, you are out of luck, buddy. There is no chance that you will understand what is going on. And they were not dogmatically trying to refute ideas either. If you read Abhinava Gupta's works or uh, uh, even Ramakanta's, Repeatedly, they are finding more agreement with their Buddhist counterparts than there are many other Hindu counterparts. So it was not like they are always like the other faith guys and these are the our faith guys. When you examine the reasons, whatever sounds most reasonable, they accepted that and whatever they could not agree with, they rejected that. And this was a fair game in classical India. And that is the platform in which 
Africa Shaivism or Kashmiri Shaivism evolved. If the Buddhist philosophy was one counterpart, there was the Hindu philosophy of Advaita Vedanta. I'm not even counting Sankhya and Nyaya because I will overwhelm you, number one. And number two, they are anyway rejected. Forget about them. So the <laughs> major part of Hindu philosophy, the Advaita Vedanta. So we have now three models. The Yogacara model of Buddhist philosophy, Sautrantika Yogacara model, and then the Trika model, and then the Advaita Vedanta. I would say, as far as their world analysis goes, you will find tremendous similarities among them. And when you listen to the philosophers, they seem to be talking only about disagreement. It is their nature. Because there are minor issues of disagreement and we are only chiseling out those minor points of disagreement because we don't need to talk about what we agree on already. So, the minor disagreement point, I would say, let us boil the whole thing down to the study of the mind. Because ultimately, reading the nature of external world is contingent upon reading your own mind. Why am I saying that? No matter how objective you claim to be, as long as there are biases in your mind, as long as you are prejudiced and you are looking the world through your jaundiced eyes, you are not going to find any objectivity outside. To ground objectivity, you have to first ground subjectivity. What am I saying? Meaning, when you are talking about others is a good guy, bad guy, for these statements to be true, your mental state needs to be correct. And therefore, all these three philosophies reflected upon their own mental state. And all the differences are based on how to understand the mind, how to analyze the mind, how to calm the mind, how to transform the mind, and how to recognize the absolute reality by the pristine state of the mind. That is the whole common agree agreement among these. Mechanisms will vary. Methods will differ. The goal is the same that how can we clean our mind and recognize reality? What is the absolute reality? Do they all agree to the same reality? That's a different issue because they adopt different meditative techniques and then based on their techniques, they go to slightly diverging conclusions. From the Yogacara perspective, the world is a projection of the mind, whether it's a, a projection of singular mind or multiple minds. There are the Santanantara, like the major prominent Buddhist philosophers say multiple minds because there are multiple streams of the mind. Some would even say a single mind, a solipsism. The same exact philosophy exists in Advaita Vedanta also single mind or multiple streams of the mind. And from the Advaita perspective, ultimate reality, what they call the Brahman, is pure consciousness. From the Trika perspective also, the absolute reality is very pure, pristine form of consciousness. For all these three philosophers, the Yogacara Buddhist, the uh, Advaita Vedantins and the Trika Saivas, consciousness is the foundation, the foundation of reflection upon reality. And you cannot question consciousness, you can question everything else. 
I can question consciousness. Why can't I question consciousness? Of course, you can doubt consciousness. But the problem is, when you ask a question, Miroj Bhai, am I conscious? That very asking merely confirms consciousness. If Miroj believes that I am not conscious, but I sh he should at least respond to my question, that doesn't make sense, right? Why would he address anything to some unconscious being? Because an unconscious being would not be able to comprehend his response. So consciousness, when you doubt, do I exist? Even for you to doubt, you need to exist. When you doubt, am I conscious? For you to doubt, you have to have consciousness. You can doubt question about everything else. You can doubt whether the table in front of you, the classroom, the teacher, the uh, guest speaker, everything is real. Whether you are dreaming or they are actually there, you can doubt. But you cannot doubt, even when you doubt the doubt, I can doubt whether I'm doubting, that doesn't even make sense. But even then, you need to, you are only confirming yourself and your mode of existence. And therefore, your questioning of consciousness does not negate consciousness, only confirms it. Trika Saibas believe the same argument and that is why in the Shiva Sutra, the first Sutra they wrote is Chaitanyam Atma. The self is of the character of consciousness. Now, even though these three schools agreed that consciousness is foundational, they disagreed on the nature of consciousness. From the Yogacara perspective, again, consciousness is momentary. There is not a permanent thing called Atma, uh, everlasting entity from the Buddhist perspective. Everything is momentary. And therefore, even consciousness is a stream, a momentary. And therefore, it is not constant, everlasting. And that is fundamentally the point of rejection for both the Advaita Vedantins as well as the uh, Trika Saivas. And the Advaita Vedantins say, but how do you know that is momentary? Even for you to question their momentariness, there's got to be you. There should be consciousness. And they try to argue that temporality or time as such is a projection of the mind and not that mind is projected by time or under time. That was their main argument. And we can again take this argument for a long conversation. From the Trika perspective, they agreed that Consciousness is not a temporal entity, constant, permanent, momentary, all these categories are creating some kind of dichotomy. These dichotomous terminology do not apply as it comes to consciousness because these are concepts. Momentariness is a concept. Permanent is a concept. Concepts are merely mental things. Concepts are based on language. Concepts are only upon consciousness. I don't think rocks have concepts. For you to have concepts, you need to have consciousness. Therefore, yes, they agreed that these are all concepts, doesn't matter. But what they proposed is that this consciousness as such is foundational and this creates this world materiality creates in the sense that it actually becomes the manifold. So that is where the Advaita Vedanta and Trika Saivism differ. 
Ad- Advaita Vedanta, there is no creation as such, there is no world as such, there is no diversity as such. Diversity is Nama Rupa, meaning you give a name, you give a form, you create the manifold, it's your projection, just like a dream, like you seeing a snake on a rope, it is your hallucination, it's not really out there. What is really out there is just a pure consciousness. Nothing else exists. That is what the Advaita Vedantins argued. The Trika Shaibas argued that uh, there is no problem with uh, that very consciousness emanating or manifesting in the form of materiality. It that singular non undivided entity becomes many and that is how you and I and our friends exist. It is basically one single entity becoming many. And in the mechanism, it also becomes embodied, meaning it assumes physicality and that is the same process in which, in totality, it, there comes the emergence of the cosmos. Like the absolute and the cosmos become like the mind and the body. Just like I have my mind and my body, the same way God is at the center, Shiva, and then the whole world, the cosmos, all the billions of galaxies, and trillions and trillions of stars are the body of Shiva. That is how Trika Shaivism or Kashmiri Shaivism envisions. So how is, if this whole projection is a singular reality, there is nothing unreal, illusory about it. Even our life, our laughter, our grief, sadness, all these are part and parcels of that same absolute. The questions come, what is the point? And how to recognize this self-nature so that we can find absolute freedom, moksha. Number one, what is the point? Rather than giving a purpose, the world is for this region, that region, because for the Advaita Vedantins, since there is no real creation, they are not going to give you the reason for creation. From the Buddhist perspective also, the world as such is enmeshed with Dukkha and nobody created the world as such. It is beginningless going on stream of Prabhaha or flow. The, you cannot ask why. It's it's just going the way it is. From the Trika Saiva perspective, because there is the central divinity, then the question is valid. Why would the Lord create a miserable world? And that is where the Saivas differ. Why do you conclude that the world is miserable? You, it is, you are used to seeing glass half empty. Why can't you start seeing glass half full? The world has both things. We learn about enjoyment, fun, being in the world. And we pick the dirt while we play on the ground and then we become miserable. The more the dirt we pick up, the more miserable we become. If we were to clean wash of all the dirt we picked up in the process of time, we would go back to the same pristine uh, natal state of joy and the world as such is joyous. We are just tied with uh, our limited body and limited mind and mental projections, all our anticipations, and then we project it to be uh, full of suffering. It, it does not need to be like that. You can choose the world to be uh, full of suffering and suffer, but you can also choose the world to be a magical place. So they developed some kind of magical realism 
that the whole world is a, almost like an endless magical projection in um, not having any particular beginning or ending, unfolding a whirlpool of multiple streams. Now, how to recognize one's true Shiva nature so that one can uh, relieve from these limitations? if not particularly suffering per se. So to relieve from uh, our limited horizons, we need to expand our horizon. That is simply what the Trika Saivas are saying, that as long as we limit ourselves into the body and identify ourselves as this person, our suffering will remain. The only way we can free ourselves from our uh, daily uh, suffering is when we shift our projection of who I am into Shivahood, that I am the totality. Then you would say, but I'm not the total. How can I pretend to be? It is, they give, a, they give an example of a drop in the ocean. A drop in the ocean, if you taste it, it is salty. It is part and parcel of the ocean. It carries all the histories and the characters of that ocean. When you, when if you were that drop, you have a choice now. You can say, I am the ocean, and you can say, I am a drop. And both are true statements. So when a drop chooses to be a drop, it has to reject the whole entire totality. And then only thinking about oneself, this infinitesimal being, and we suffer. But if we find ourselves as integral to the collective, then the Kashmiri Shaibijam, this Trika, believes that then there is no suffering because we'll recognize the whole process is as a constant unfolding of the being. Things happen, come and go. We, we keep playing like surfing on the ocean. And therefore, there is no, there is no final ending or uh, constant suffering or anything. It's just uh, ups and downs of constant unfolding, infolding of the same primordial essence. The unique contribution of uh, Trikasavijam, you can find that prominently in Abhinava Gupta's approach, is to organize all different meditative techniques in a single stream called Upaya. So therefore, I call this Trika Shastra as the Upaya Shastra. Upaya means the means, methods approach, how to recognize reality, the upaya for us to attain liberation. What do I mean by organizing into single stream? If you consult the Vedanta texts, they will only talk about the absolute nature and they will not discuss rituals and mantras and all of that. If you consult other texts, then they will maybe only discuss rituals. But what the Trika system did is within these three central upayas, later some even added on upaya or methodless method, the first method, the Shambhava upaya, is a pure illumination of the absolute without any effort. It's an effortless sudden realization. This effortless sudden realization type practices can be found also in Zen or Dzogchen practices if you consult different forms of Buddhism. This we call Sambhava Upaya. There is no reflection. There is a sudden emergence of the absolute reality. And the second approach we call the Shakta Upaya, 
and in this one there is no external verbalization articulation but a pure refinement of the mind and this process is a meticulous cognitive process called shakta upaya in the shakta upaya central uh, the central practice is kalika kula krama or tantric practice even this tantric practice can be performed differently people can use mantras worship mandalas uh, visualize different images of the deities and that will not be the purely cognitive exercise alone the that practice could be called anaba upaya accepting yourself as a limited being and then adopt external means of worship the using the sound using the form using the order smell using external objects like flowers and rice grains and liquor or uh, you know uh, panchamrita like the nectar and whatever substances you like to use but in the first or the shakta upaya you are starting a meditation from the constitution of a pure object of your consciousness and you focus on the rise of that object in your mind you focus on how long it stays in your mind and then you shift your attention when the object dissolves in your mind and you have no word to talk about it and then you focus back on your own mental state that you were focusing on you now are aware of your mind and you will continue being aware of your mind and you will see your mind slowly dissolves and in the fourth stage you have no words even to label your mind as your mind and then you become conscious of your own ego and stay on your ego let that ego continue as a central focus of your attention and the ego also dissolves and then you have no words to say at all anything because the ego is also gone what is left there this absolute void empty state they are not calling it nothing they are not calling it complete emptiness they are calling it fullness instead full in the sense that this is from which arises all these triadic structures of the cognized the cognitive process and the cognizing subject therefore what we have then is a complete meditative practice from the outside to the inside from external to internal and this is what they call the shakta practice in the third or anaba upaya or practice or approach you have the articulation of the mantra you have the gestures you have the visualizations and you have the arrangement of the colors and uh, all all geometric forms and completion of rituals so you practically engage in ritual life endorse the external rituals and you develop a mechanism of going from the most external layer of consciousness to the most inner mode of consciousness in the most external layer you have pure objectivity pure mandala and in the most inner layer even your ego is dissolved you do not even have your own ego so this is how you progress from externality to internality 
and you endorse or embrace the external modes as your own expansion. A metaphor commonly given here is that of a spider that comes from very early time. Not all spiders do that, but some of the spiders are able to reabsorb their own web. So the example here of the spider is just like the web comes out of the body of the spider and the spider can reabsorb his own web the same way the external reality is your web-like projection and you can reabsorb the web-like projection within yourself and return to that pristine mode of pure consciousness unmarred by anything. For both the Yogacara Buddhist and the uh, Trika Saivas, Consciousness is autonomous in creating. Consciousness does not need anything else to create. It's, it's constantly creative. But from the Yogacara Buddhist perspective, like in the dream, what consciousness creates is not substantially there. For the yoga, for the Trika Saivas, uh, it is substantial enough because this is what we feel every day, our life, our house, our car, our jobs, everything else. So what is the final goal of liberation then is to recognize this unfolding, infolding reality for the Trika perspective. It's not really running out of the world. It is rather recognizing our proper place on uh, earth in the world and be a participant in whatever the best way we can because we are intrinsically of the divine nature, Shiva nature, and that Shiva nature expresses in every mode, every activity we do because if Shiva does fivefold creation, we also do the same fivefold creation creation, meaning creation, sustenance, dissolution, punishment, and grace. These five acts are unique to Shiva, but unique to us also. We also create, we also sustain, we also dissolve, we also punish sometimes something. We also uh, do the grace um, and, and, um, uh, and so fivefold activities are also intrinsic to our very more of being. Based on these fivefold aspects, Lord Shiva is viewed as having Panchavakra, five faces. And if you ever go to Nepal, uh, you will see in Pashupati, the Lord is Pashupati, Lord Shiva is viewed as having five faces. Although there are only four faces in four directions, the fifth is considered the absolute formless, the upper face, uh, a formless face, a faceless face. And there are corresponding shaktis or goddesses uh, with each and every face of Pashupati. So the, in Nepal, Sarva Amnaya practice is very central. And Sarva Amnaya simply means that in each and every face of Bhairava or Shiva, there is a corresponding deity and the sadhana or practice incorporates those esoteric mantras and mandalas corresponding to those particular faces. And that is exactly where Tantra begins. And for that and more, you can always come to Vimarsa Foundation. We have substantial amount of information already there. I would like to switch to uh, uh, question and answer because I promised I would save time, but then I might have already gone too far. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Timur uh, Your lecture was very profound. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so I'll begin our question and answer session. And uh, so we have a student here on the campus and also online audience. So 
since our number is not that big, you can raise a question uh, and unmute and put forward your question to Dr. Timosina. Uh, question, anybody? You have to come, a uh, student, you have to come here. To... So here's a one, our uh, one PhD student, Stephen, has some question. Yes. Yes. Hi, doctor. Thank you so much for your uh, for your lecture today. I, I was wondering if you could say something about um, the the Kosmiri Shaivistic view of the mind or consciousness in relation to the senses. Uh, I'm bringing this up, you know, thinking of like the Buddhist understanding where the mind or consciousness is considered one of the senses. So they all exist together, combined. You know, a uh, taste, uh, smell, you know, touch. Tact, you know, all of those are all, all, all considered sense media that are being interpreted and moving this way and that way. And, you know, so I, I guess my question is, um, you know, because earlier in your in your lecture, you were bringing up the difference between, uh, you know, dualistic schools of thought and non-dualistic thought. So in the Kashmiri system here of Shaivism, how does mind relate to the senses and does it differ depending on whether it's dualistic or non-dualistic? Uh, there are two um, responses to this. Particularly, I'm I'm going to stress on the Shakta uh, approach. I have also published something along those lines. Maybe if I see that, I'll just pick up and show it to you. Um, the first thing is sensory faculties are um, they constitute a mandala and they all merge in the singularity of the ego. Meaning within ego, all the sensory processes are there happening or it is it can merge within that. But when it comes out, can they collide? Sometimes they can, like in synesthesia, we have seen the sensory functionings colliding. Uh, but uh, the, even in classical terminology, they will have a, uh, like uh, seeing the sound, particularly when you go to Pashyanti level, meaning seeing your own sound. How do you see the sound? That's how the mantras are seen rather than just heard. So sensory collapsing sensory processes in a singular mode is possible when you go to the deeper level of consciousness. When they merge outward, then they retain from particularly from the shakta perspective they retain some of the spontaneity it is not that they are simply uh, powerless organs uh, without any functioning if there is no proper functioning from within for an organ to remain an organ there is always some level some degree of luminosity Yes, if the ego suspends the process, the uh, eyes alone cannot see. But the spark in the mm -hmm. eyes, the retinal connection, all these processes also feed back to the ego. And that is how it is not a, a singular one-way channel, but rather a binary process of feeding uh, with each other so that if the ego feeds its consciousness and teleology, like projection to particular object, the same way the sensory faculties feed back with the information going back towards singularity. The, the consciousness can manifest not just within these given modes of sensory faculties. One could, a yogi could evolve a different type of sensory perception. That is a remote viewing, remote seeing, remote sensing, uh, uh, things like that. And the, the remote viewing would be still seeing, but that seeing is not actually with these eyes. So we, within the mind, there is also the eye, basically, or the ear, remote hearing. But that is a faculty only limited to some refined yogis. I had, you know, based on Mahatma Manjari, there was one book, give me one second. It's a little unorganized. If I find that, I could uh, give the reference. Anybody, any questions? Yeah. 
looks like it's it's going to take it's a little unorganized so it might take time <laughs> but, but if you go through my publication you will find i had based on the mahartha manjari uh, uh, i had one essay mahartha manjari is again a very shakta philosophical text so i had given uh, a perspective on the body uh, uh, particularly uh, my writings on tantra i have many essays to stress on the body embodiment and uh, you can see a dozen of essays on addressing embodiment in tantra and so i found that this uh, embodied mode of consciousness is crucial to tantra and i've tried to address with my limited knowledge please consult there okay thank, thank you, you so me. much thank you uh, we have another question uh, from another ma student tuan please come here Thank you so much. It's very enlightening lecture today. Uh, Hello, Professor. Thank you so much for giving a very interesting uh, subject on the Gamiya Sarvism. Uh, during the uh, lecture, I recognize something that you mentioned about <clears throat> the importance of the uh, uh, practice of uh, uh, just, uh, reciting mantra and uh, visualization and ritual. I'm just wondering those kind of uh, practice uh, have any common with compared with the uh, uh, very popular practice in Hin Hinduism in general. Uh, if they have some kind of specific only for this particular sect, then uh, I would like to find out. And uh, when we're talking about the consciousness, it's a very important uh, concept of uh, Abhinavan Gupta's teaching. Um, so when we're talking about consciousness, and now we're talking about uh, visualization, and we're talking about uh, uh, citing mantra and ritual, uh, how do we uh, you know, interpolate those kind of concepts? Because one seems to be very abstract, and one is more like a, on the uh, practice level. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. When we go to a Hindu temple, we, we encounter some things as given. One, there will be a deity and a priest will be muttering something or the other. For the audience, it is mostly unknown. <laughs> um, and whatever he is muttering, we let's call that mantra. And then there can be prayers of some devotional hymns. So uh, if, when the devotees are involved and public function going on, mostly that devotion, emotional connection with the deity is at the center. They all have some or other characteristics of tantric practices. But what is different in tantric practice in particular is the system. If you go to the big ocean, then there is no stream going in any direction. Everything is everywhere. Um, but uh, when you go to a river, then it goes flows in a particular direction. The same way Tantra is about a system. Now you have this particular deity and this particular mantra and then this particular mandala for you to visualize and all the practices are meticulously laid out by a teacher and that is what you practice that is what constitutes the popular uh, or, or the esoteric tantrism the thing is the fact of the matter is what we call popular hinduism today is an an unorganized popular popular popularization of the many of the tantric practices at one time. If you go and ask the priest, they will say it is Vedic. They are worshipping Kali. They are worshipping Lakshmi. They are worshipping whatever Tripura Sundari. And then they are more used to call it Vedic because calling it Vedic sounds palatable. When you say tantric, it freaks out people. This is tantric, scary thing going on. So uh, it's a, but if you go to the actual Vedic text, you are not going to find any description for the statues, 
those deities enlivening like uh, the Hindu ritual of life installation, installing life of the statue to the daily ritual, morning ritual, evening ritual, all of these, most of these anyway, are borrowed from one or another tantric agamas. But it's you could call it like fusion. That's what living a life is like. It's a, also in many Buddhist uh, practices, you can see Theravada original teachings merged in Vajrayana teachings, and you can find that even in Chonkhaba's uh, works, you know, if you read Chonkhaba, you will find that Chonkhaba was meticulously deriving from uh, original uh, uh, Shastras. The same way, popular Hinduism is a blend of everything. And the Tantric is just a meticulous focus on some specific practices and making it organized so you can actually uh, practice it. So uh, you go popular Hinduism, you worship one deity today, another deity tomorrow, everywhere, every temple. And even in a single temple, tens of deities being worshipped. In Tantric practice, you have a focus on one particular deity, one mantra, one mandala, and you are spending hours and hours and hours of time to visualize upon that image, and that is what constitutes the uh, uh, Tantric practice. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, any uh, audience on the Zoom, if you have any question, you can unmute and put forward your question to Dr. Timosina. Namaskar Deepak Dai, I see you there. <laughs> I know you have uh, um, unmuted yourself. Yes, I have unmuted it. <laughs> I, I could not miss your talk, so I got up early. <laughs> 10 o'clock is early for me, and I'm here. Uh, it is a really enlightening talk, obviously, as always. So I'm very pleased to see you online. Uh, of course, we are running out of time. There are so many things that I have in mind. You know, it's a, such a wonderful topic that you have enlightened your audience. Uh, other than that, uh, let me reserve my comments and then go to other uh, participants if they have any uh, questions or any comments. But I do have to. Uh, you, you can. Sorry. I'm I'm done. Uh, did yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Uh, any other uh, so audience from any question? I have a question. Oh, well, come here. So one question from our student again. Oh, come here. Sit. Uh, thank you for your wonderful speech. I have just uh, just just uh, curiosity. Uh, Kashmir is a place of uh, India and Pakistan border. So uh, and Shaivism is a sect of Hinduism. So are there any sect in uh, area related in India or any other places in the world? Um any other places uh, for the practice of the Shaivism, you mean? Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so this is, um, as I mentioned uh, in the discourse, that yes, um, significant contribution was made by the Kashmiri philosophers, and then we are labeling Kashmiri Shaivism, but um, Shaivism was universal, meaning it was spread very widely, at least throughout the South Asian subcontinent. Yeah. And I also derived examples from Nepal, like how some of the hardcore tantric practices that are attributed to being Kashmiri are actually alive in Nepal, being practiced and for more than 1,000 years, not just like today, somebody started yesterday, but over a thousand years, these practices have lived there. And so therefore to call this as purely just Kashmiri, I think is a very limited understanding, not knowing the expansion, but still only because the most prominent philosophers came from Kashmir, 
we are accepting the title as a Kashmiri, not that the whole philosophy and particularly practices as it comes to practice, it was spread throughout South Asia in historically early times. And uh, the, the Shaiva related materials uh, we can start finding in Nepal from the earliest of its history actually, uh, from Kathmandu Valley, the whatever the first uh, um, uh, inscriptional uh, record you find, third or fourth century Hanigaon, already relates to something to do with Shaivism. From Shiva temple, like a fourth or fifth century from Pashupati area, we start finding uh, the the uh, Shaiva materials there from Nepal. So, mm. and and I'm not trying to just say in Nepal because you can go to uh, Kerala or you can go to Tamil Nadu and then you start finding the same way really early yeah. history uh, but it, because of the popularity of the term we are simply accepting it thank you thank you thank you so much Pritesh uh, uh, you can unmute and ask questions so Thank you, sir. Thank you for a lovely talk. Uh, so I would ask, how would you then define it? Would you would you call this trika, or would you call this kaula, uh, or just non-dual Shaivism um, in, in you, totality? When um, uh, Shivado, when you call Shivadoyavada or non-dual Shaivism, it will include the kaula and the trika and pratyavigya and spanda and uh, a number of major schools. So uh, the non-dual Shaivism or Shivadvaya Vada is still a valid name. Um, if you want to call it Kashmiri Shaivism, I have no objection to that. I just am showing how historically it will be only confining. Um, and we are practicing this Shaivism in America. So it's not just simply of the Kashmir yeah. matter. Uh, so uh, actually, I have a funny anecdote when I established the department and I was using many of the texts, of course, from Kashmir origin and some pundits who were very locally conscious um, objected that I'm just simply trying to promote Kashmir. You know, so sometimes these universal philosophies are misjudged by narrow-minded people because they think that uh, am I, you know, like uh, trying to only talk about Kashmir, and we don't do that, you know. But when we say Tibetan Buddhism, that is again like a lot of that was composed in India or Nepal, and then uh, a lot of that in the modern world in the twentieth century is outside of Tibet, actually. It's not in uh, Tibet, so it could be considered the same way. It's uh, called Tibetan Buddhism, uh, but uh, there's not one type of Buddhism in Tibet, so it's again a misnomer, and then it's not really written by all the Tibetans anymore, or people are even who call Tibetan are not living in Tibet, they are American Tibetans actually. <laughs> so it's a it's a, the title um, that we should not be too much obsessed or focused on. It is the essence, and the essence I find absolutely universal and very much applicable in our modern life, and I find that very uh, um, heart numbing and interesting. Thank you so much. One Thank last, you. One last question before we end. Any question from audience? So I will ask one last question. Uh, what contribution did uh, Chemendra um, make to this uh, Kashmir Shaivism tradition? This uh, uh, we heard. Chemendra was uh, um, uh, I. Chemaraja uh, is different, and Chemendra is different. They are different characters. Chemendra has in aesthetics and in poetry a good uh, uh, number of works are there. In particular, when it comes to advancing philosophical argument as such, um, I do not uh, know, maybe a bit marginal, uh, but his contribution in poetry and aesthetics would be more prominent. 
he did a lot of work on Buddhism too, right, Chamindra? Yes, yes, yes. So the, these authors were sometimes um, very capable of switching their positions to to more like a free thinkers, you know. And and we should not think that only in modern America that we are able to read all different traditions. They were they were really reading and practicing, exercising different traditions and learning from each other. Thank you so much, Dr. Trimishala, for a wonderful talk. We learned a lot about Saivism, even the comparative study. <laughs> we learned about Yogacara and other um, Udvita Vedantas. And so we, I think we need another follow-up lectures on this kind of, it's not enough to, time to discuss all this. Um, and we greatly appreciate your, uh, your lecture for coming to our campus to give a talk. And uh, so thank you everyone who attended. And have a restful, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miraji, Professor, Mir mm -hmm. Professor Sakya, and Professor Simkada. Thank you. Thank you so much. And all the students, thank you so much. Let's give a warm up. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Dipak Dai, for joining.